um, or this, you know, since September about here to serve. So this is sort of a fun, uh, in a way, if we could have skipped a chapter, it might have been this one. But to be honest, I think it's good to come back and get the grounding for why it is that we do serve. I think that's really important. In fact, one of the major conversations I have with people at the church is, um, is why do you serve and what's the motivation behind that? Because the motivation behind your service will determine whether you uh, burn out as a servant or not. And we have a lot of people that burn out sometimes because <clears throat> they want to do lots of things and they're falling into that old narrative that we talked about in book one, which is that God is happy with me if I do things for God. And um, so what happens is they start off with one thing, they add another thing, another thing. Pretty soon, you know, they're at church every time the lights are on. And then after a while, they get mad that they're at church every time the lights are on. And so those are some of the issues that we want to look at. But I also think that um, Smith in this chapter on service drives us back to some basic things that I think are important for us to think about in our own lives, but also as we are the community um, together, the, the church together. And I want to start out with a... Um, a quote from Richard Halverson, who was the, um, the chaplain to the U.S. Senate for many years, um, has written a book about some of his devotions, just very good stuff. But he says this, quote, Christianity started out in Palestine as a fellowship. Then it moved to Greece and it became a philosophy. Then it went to Rome and it became an institution. Then it went to Europe and it became a government. Finally, it came to America where we made it into a business. And I think that's very telltale. Um, and we see that. We see the marketing, right, of Christian stuff. And, um, and also just, you know, just that whole idea. And so part of this is how do we come back to sort of the root of what Christianity is about? And, and how do we keep that before us? And one of the things that Smith says is he says, well, part of it is that you're learning to live into this paradigm of being a part of the kingdom of God. So, so he's building this way of thinking where we sort of have our natural way of approaching things, the way we always have in life. You know, we have a certain amount of um, factors that we bring into a decision we make. But then Smith says, okay, but what about, you know, the being part of the kingdom? How does that change your thinking? And definitely... Um, in these narratives, one, the false narrative being that the most important thing is what I get to this kingdom narrative that the most important thing is what I do and how I serve. Um, there's a big difference between those two worlds. And so he asks the question and begs it, I think, you know, if the life of discipleship of Jesus really does take root in a community of people, like if, if Jesus is really here and it's changing us, then how do we know if it's beginning to make a difference? And that's a great question. It's a great question for us to think about. He says it happens in, in um, committee meetings, and I think that's also really a great observation. Because, but, but I would say what it does is it makes us ask different questions than we asked before. That's really the big thing. Um, it, whether it's our family, whether it's um, you know here at church, whether it's in a committee, whether it's working um, in caring for other people, no matter what it is, it causes us to ask different questions um, than what we would have asked. And it becomes that kind of um, paradigm that changes our focus from just thinking about what we want or what we need to thinking about something that's very much larger than we are. Um, this whole being caught up in the kingdom of God and, and how does that work. So, so each day we're making, you know, thousands of decisions all the time. We're making, you know, all kinds of different um, things we're thinking about. We're relating to all kinds of different people. Um, we're, you know, with people that we know well and people that we don't know well. And, and all of these things are impacted by the idea of what does it mean, you know, to be part of this kingdom of God. So that's what we're talking about with this service. Now, one last point, um, and this isn't in the book, but thought it might help us. Um, there's also, I think, a um, certain ways of looking at our Christian journey which are important. And, and not just for the journey for us as individuals, but also for the journey of being the people of God together, being the church together. And, and there's another sort of paradigm that talks a little bit like Halverson did about how Christianity turned into a business in America. But it's this, it's, a, 
it's what's sort of the movement of an institution. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but there's a, there's a parallel where oftentimes institutions in the end, and the church can be an institution when it's at its worst, okay? I think it, when it's at its best, it's organic. It's, it's actually a live entity. It's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a body, as Paul would say, the body of Christ. But when we become institutionalized, then what happens is the most important thing is the preservation of the institution, okay? And we've all seen this all over the place, right? Like, it's the group that says, you know, well, we're not as effective as we used to be, so we're going to really put pressure on everybody so that we become more effective. And what they've just done is they've actually put the first, you know, they've, they've actually put their first foot in the grave of the death of that institution. So, so here's the thing, like, this whole idea of being the kingdom of God drives us back to the basics of what Jesus wants us to be. And that is that the church is this movement of God that is interacting in the world to bring about God's reign and kingdom. The problem becomes when we forget that. And so there's this um, sort of, I don't even know what you call it, an acronym or something. It's not quite an acronym, but um, it's very often that the church moves from being a movement to becoming a monument. And then the last sort of point of institutionalization is that it becomes a mausoleum. And what that means is that it's easy to move from being a movement to being a monument. Now, in the monument phase, what happens is everybody sits around and they remember how it used to be. Have you ever been a part of a group that did that? Oh, it was so cool when this was happening, and it was so great when this... Remember the growth we had? We had young people then. We had this, we had that. It was just so wonderful. And all of a sudden now, instead of marching ahead into this kingdom living, now you're beginning to look in the past. And then the final step, actually the death of the institution, is where it becomes the mausoleum. And basically they set up pictures all over the place to remember all the things they did in the past. But the reality is that, that they've died inside. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I think this is important for us to think about um, as a community, but also as individuals. Because it's very easy also in our Christian life to do that. You know, to sort of be part of that movement, but then later say, gosh, it was just so much more real to me back then. And, oh, I have all these wonderful victories and things were happening, but, but now it feels sort of dead. And, and the feeling of deadness, you know, isn't the end of things. It could be the beginning of things. I mean, we're talking about resurrection, right? I mean, the central to the kingdom of God is the fact that, um, that death brings life. You know, the end of something brings a new thing. It brings resurrection. So when we live into that, God can do new things in us. So the key, though, is not moving to that last part where you're just so stuck in the past that there's no future. And, um, and that's, I think, where service actually comes in. I think service comes in as a positive thing that renews us and helps us to understand what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's why, um, that's why Smith says that this true narrative is that other people's needs matter. They're important, and we need to think about that, okay? Now, the reason I think this puts us back in touch with, um, you know, with the whole idea of uh, the kingdom of God is because it's so incredibly central to who Jesus is and what Jesus teaches us to do. And I know this isn't a passage that um, Smith brings about in the, in the study, but I wanted to just remind you of the story in Mark 10 it's actually a pretty comical story um, because it's the story of um, these two sons, you know, two brothers who come to Jesus and they say to him, you know, give us whatever we want. You know, we, um, or, you know, can you give us where, and Jesus says, well, what is it you want? And they say, well, in your kingdom, we want to sit on your right and your left hand side. <laughs> and, um, and it's, so, it's such an interesting, you know, uh, discussion because you know right away that it's just all about them. They're thinking about positional authority. I mean, like in that whole hierarchical kind of way of thinking, you know, you'd have the king on the central throne and then whoever is on the right and the left are like the next in command kind of thing. And so, so they're really saying to Jesus, we want these places of prominence in your kingdom. And, and what they're really saying is we don't understand what your kingdom is about. That's what they're really saying, but they don't realize it yet. And so he says, well, can you drink of the cup that I, I'm going to drink of? And they're like, Sure, well, what is it? And he says, well, I'm going to go and die. Are you willing to die? And there, and there comes, see, the crux of the matter. 
The question is, are you willing to give up your life for the kingdom? Are you willing to give up your life for the kingdom? Now, the very funny thing about that question is that you only will find your life for the kingdom if you give up your life for the kingdom. So it's very, you know, counterintuitive, but that's part of what he's saying is that, you know, if you give your life, you're going to find it. Remember that? You know, only the one who loses their life will find it, who gives their life up for the kingdom. And so they say, oh, no, we can drink the cup, and all these things happen. And then all of a sudden, the rest of the disciples show up, and, um, and they're a little ticked. Like you're thinking, well, maybe they're going to be mad that James and John had asked Jesus this question. You know, maybe they think it's very arrogant of them to, you know, try to get these positions when they're not around. Or, you know, like they're not, maybe they know they're just not understanding the kingdom. But then as you read the passage, you realize they're actually a little mad because they would have liked to have asked the same question because they don't really get it either. And so Jesus says, he sort of says, okay, let's huddle up. You know, this is a teaching moment. You know, I've got to talk to you about what this is really about. And he says this, he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, okay? He's saying, there's the main model we've always seen, you know? The, the, the leaders lord it over the other, uh, those who are below them. Their high officials exercise authority of them. Then he says this, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must become the slave of all. Now those, you know, those words must have just started to knock the air out of them in a good way. And then he ties it up, though, with, with what he's come to do. And he says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so he says, in case you have any question about how this works, um, walk with me to the cross and you're going to find out. And, um, and that is going to bring in then this new way of serving and being and entering into the, uh, the kingdom of God. So Smith says, and I think he's right on with this, that um, the reason that we can serve others is because we have this confident assurance that God is active in us and has called us to be a part of the kingdom of God. And, and with that as a basis for service, you know, we're not serving because we think somehow God will be happier with us, but we're serving out of a sense of gratitude that God has called us to be God's people and to join in this way of being uh, that really does symbolize and encapsulates this kingdom of God that we're called to be a part of. So that's today, I think, the basis of what you need to talk about. And I'll just give one more sort of caveat, I think. And it comes sort of full circle back to the idea of burning out. And I would encourage you as you're talking about serving and thinking about serving today to, to also be honest about if you feel like you're serving too much. I think that um, you know, it's very easy for us to get caught into things that sort of grow beyond our ability you know, to sort of handle them. And it's okay to admit that and to say, you know, I need to pull back. Um, in fact, that might be what a, one of the things God wants you to do. Or perhaps you figure, I'm serving, but I'm serving because it's coming more out of a sort of codependency or maybe out of a sense of I need to do this or if I don't do this, things will fall apart or I, nobody else would do it, so I did it. I mean, I think those are really important questions to ask. Um, my own philosophy, although we don't talk about this much here, is that if every single one of us were serving in one way, we would be able to do everything God's calling us to do. If every single person had one area of service that they took seriously, I mean, that's really what it means to be the body of Christ. That we're all gifted, we're all called, um, we're all equal in terms of what God's trying to do through us. Nobody's more important than anybody else. We're the body of Christ together. And God will work in the midst of that. So, so one image I've always held out, and I'll end with this, is um, you ever been on the, a plane, you know, and the poor flight attendants are trying to give all the instructions about what happens if the plane goes down and all that kind of stuff. Everybody's, of course, ignoring them, you know. But, um, but there's that one description of the oxygen mask, right? And so they take out the oxygen mask and they say it'll, it'll drop in front of you. And, you know, they start to explain how you pull it out and put it on and all these things. But they always say this. If you're traveling with a child or someone who requires assistance, secure your mask first. Isn't that interesting? So why do they say that? 
because you're not going to be much help if you're passed out, right? <laughs> you know, well, but there's the, there's the point, isn't it? So if you're serving, but you're doing it to the point of exhaustion, you're really not going to be much help to yourself or to others. And maybe one of the things you need to do is say, okay, you know, am I serving too much as well? I mean, that's always a good sort of evaluative point. And remember, it, it doesn't put you into a false paradigm. Okay, it's not a false narrative. Because remember, this is about the kingdom of God, about the kingdom of God coming to life in you and then spreading through you to others. And if you're sort of like, I hate this, and, I hate that, and, uh, you know, it's not really coming. You know, you need to take care of yourself as well. So, so blessings to you as you talk about service today. It's a great, um, great opportunity. And next week we'll be talking about um, living with those we disagree with. And what does it mean to, um, you know, to be this larger family of God and um, to allow for differences of opinion about different things? How do we learn from each other? And we'll be talking about all that as well. So that's chapter four. So blessings as you meet today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.